Hey, yo, from the kingdom of Ohio, this is O-Culture, where we transmit conversations on esoteric art, science, and history at 528 hertz. I am your host, Ryan Peverly. Welcome to the show. Thank you for choosing to spend your time here with me. And thank you to all the new subscribers out there across this great round ball we're on or this oblate spheroid, or this flat plane, or whatever shape you think the Earth may be. Personally, I think it's phallic because we're all getting fucked on it. Anyway, thank you for being here. My guest this episode is Joe DeCat. Joe is a filmmaker who released a documentary a few years ago called All the Gold You Can Eat that tackles the subject of Ormus. This is a topic that's interested me for many, many years, but it's one I go in and out of in terms of interest. But it reemerged as an interest for me after recording episode 13 when I was talking spiritual alchemy and advanced mineral-based healing with Satchel McMahon. That was a fun chat. I would suggest as a companion piece you maybe download that one as well. And Ormus is something that's been discussed recently on some other podcasts that I listened to. So a couple loose synchronicities there that I thought needed to be followed up on. So I called up Joe to have this fun little chat about Ormus, alchemy, magic, science, mathematics, and a whole lot more. Enjoy! Hey Joe, what's going on, man? How's it going, mate? You alright? Yeah, yeah, sorry. I had just hit the bathroom real quick and you called. So ah, I... it's, it's always the way, isn't it? Just when you got your your bits in hand, someone gives you a <laughs> shout, don't they? Yeah, man, yeah, that's that's kind of how life goes, isn't it? Isn't it just? Serendipities are the wrong kind, yeah. <laughs> so how... So, um, Go ahead. Yeah. Ryan? Joe? I'm here. How are you? How are you today? I'm doing well, Joe. How are you? Yeah, all right. It's it's a sunny day, sunny, wintry day down here in Brighton in the UK, which is quite nice for change. So uh, yeah. It's actually clear and sunny here in the States, in Ohio, where I'm at, so that's also a change. It's been very uh, cloudy and... Uh, I don't know if you if you're into the whole chemtrail thing, but it's been been. I've I've followed that story a little bit. I, it's a difficult one, isn't it? That whole um, you know, there's some interesting. Uh, what are you saying? It's a day day to, to to be watching chemtrails. This week has been pretty heavy, but the last two days have been actually pretty clear. So it's been it's been nice to you know to like go outside and actually see the sun. <laughs> Yeah. So anyways, yeah, there but you go. that's that's a whole other rabbit hole that we don't need to go down it, right it, now. It is not. That's one I don't know enough about to uh, yeah. to comment on. What you do know something about, I think, is this documentary that you made. Now, this was back in 2013 when you released it, right? Something like that, yeah, a few years ago, three years yeah, ago. Yeah. Something well, like that now, yeah. My apologies for waiting four years to talk to you about it. I wasn't That's absolutely fine. Better late than never. <laughs> right, I mean, I've been but... waiting for you to call, to be honest. But uh, you know, here you are at last. <laughs> I wasn't podcasting back then. Uh, I should have been. I'm late to the podcast party. But anyways, so it's called "All the Gold You Can Eat." For those of uh, the listeners that haven't heard of it, could you summarize it? Well, as as we get into this conversation, you'll realize, you'll realize it's, and I'm sure you realize it's quite a difficult one to summarize mm-hmm. because it's it's essentially the story of a sort of unknown mineral or an unrecognized mineral that has been sort of floating around the scene in various guises for a while. Ultimately, what brought it back into the fold was the discovery or sort of rediscovery by this farmer in Arizona called David Hudson, who tried to patent this material or tried to get a patent sort of describing it. Now, the issue is that it seems to have all sorts of weird behaviors, properties and stuff. And one of them is that apparently it can be turned into gold. So, as with anything like this, the the story takes many different angles in the real world. So the, the documentary itself kind of starts in one way and then takes another route. My my thing in the film was always, you know, as I got further into it, so many there were so many angles to this weird material and so many stories that people coming up with, but so little hard fact that halfway through the film I kind of make a decision. It's like, well, look, I need to try and find out if the gold angle is true. If at least someone can prove to me or show me that they can really turn not gold, into gold, then maybe there is a story here. So that's the basis of the documentary. I'm following these leads, which started off with the story with David Hudson, on the road for a couple of years, meeting people, hear them talk about it. And eventually I find someone who says he will, essentially an alchemist, who says he'll show me how to take this weird material and turn it into gold. Yeah, so this weird material is known as Ormus, O-R-M-U-S, although when it was first discovered it was, I believe... 
O R M E S as as sort of a, a pluralized version of an acronym, right? So the acronym uh, originally stood for orbitally rearranged monoatomic elements, and then almost. So the theory behind that is David Hudson, who initially made these discoveries. His theory behind the material is is that it's materials that exist in singular atomic structures, as in it's it's metals of a certain part of the um, periodic table that don't form the standard lattice kind of interlocking atomic structures. So let's say you take a, a bunch of silver atoms. In normal structures, what they'll do is they'll link together and they'll give you what looks like metal, shiny surface, certain properties. If those at- atoms, individual atoms of silver, were somehow kind of restructured at the atomic level, so individually they, 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 they have a different shape for some reason, they're not going to bond to each other in the same way. So what you have is silver atoms, but that don't behave like silver does. So he called them orbitally rearranged monoatomic atoms in so much as the, the orbits of the electrons on the outside are rearranged in such a way because of the structure that they don't link with the electrons of the neighboring atom. Uh, in that respect, they're monatomic because so they sit, the theory is they sit as individual atoms looking differently, more like a powder or a ceramic than a metal. So that was the initial idea, orbitally, re- orbitally rearranged uh, monatomic atoms, ORME. And then there's some biblical references to a substance called Ormus. So that kind of got taken on somehow. Yeah, it's we have this strange idea that once we know, once we give something a name, we know what it is. But uh, you just need to look at, you know, at the field of medicine to realise there's a lot of illnesses out there that have been given a name, a diagnosis, but no one knows what it is. So... Uh, there's 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 a lot in a name that is uh mis misleading if that makes sense sure yeah so these are elements but they're observable right well this is this is the that's an interesting way of putting it this is the the the, the fundamental issue with the question here is that we know how to measure let's go back to silver we know how to measure silver we put it in a spectrometry machine or whatever a mass spectrometer bombard it in a certain way and it gives a reading of what that is. If it's silver, the reading is such and such. So that's how we, we measure. I say we, obviously, I mean people who know how to do this. Measure the atomic, the, the, the elemental structures of, uh, of samples. Now, if something doesn't behave like silver, but is silver, it's not going to read in the same way. So the, the question here is, is like there's a theory that says there's something here, but we just don't know how to measure it. So the, the proponents of the Ormus theory are saying, look, there's a material which is a bunch of elements that we already know about, but, but that exists in a different form. The scientists will say, well, show us. It's not there. Look, we take this sample and there's nothing there. And the people from the Ormus community say, well, that's the whole point, is we're saying it's in a different form, so you can't measure it. Yeah. And the scientists are saying, but we can't measure it. So, so there's a bit of a sort of circular argument there. It's like, well, does it exist? How do you measure it? What is it? What I tried to do in the film was come back to that link that said, look, if we can take a sample that has very limited amounts of gold in it, of this material in its, in its one form, where you're saying this is Ormus, it is comprised of various elements, some of which are in the Ormus state, which are metals. If you can knock that back into the metallic form and reanalyze it and show that there was gold in that sample or metal or silver or whatever, then at least you're showing a footprint of the material and saying look this is worth now exploring further because the reality is we we don't have a firm there isn't a very firm theory of what's actually going on but at least you can say we can show the footprint if you see what i mean yeah so yeah, to definitely. say your, your initial question was you know these are these are elements that what was it are they measurable or not at the minute it seems they are not measurable to science because science doesn't know exactly what they are so there's no method really to create a a set of structures or a set of tabulation if you like that says how much of this stuff there is in a, in a given sample well okay so let's go back just a step or two and let's talk about then the discovery or maybe rediscovery that david hudson made could you take us through that story you know what he actually found what it looks like what it feels like so this is where it really starts getting tricky because and one of the reasons why i'm not so involved in the field anymore is because there's a lot of bullshit around this original story Mm-hmm. and Hudson tells the story in one way, you hear other people. I've been in touch with a few of the people who 
were involved in the original sort of sampling process and when he tried to get it a patent on it this is way back in the 1980s i think early 90s so it's the story has taken on somewhat of a you know somewhat of a mythology when hudson pre- pre- presents the story he embellishes it i guess with information that i'm not sure is relevant or real he presents it in a very scientific manner but it's very difficult to unpick of what he's actually saying is true and what isn't true there is he does present a very convincing tale his story is there he was he had some land uh he was trying to mine it for gold uh, as a farmer his land wasn't being very productive so he tried to see if he could you know mine it for gold and as he was doing this he was recovering a strange substance a strange white powder that was clogging up the machines and had some really weird properties that's the beginning of his story he then says you know he spent millions of dollars in 10 years trying to discover what this stuff was in the process finds out that it can be under certain situations knocked back to a metallic form and then he starts making some pretty big leaps into the world of, of, of the esoteric and this is where the story gets complicated and difficult because ultimately the stories that he then starts telling muddy the water in terms of what his goals are and what he's saying this stuff is because then it just becomes not just that there's a mineral there that isn't measurable by science but potentially can be could be gold which is a very interesting scientific discovery in itself just to say that we have there are elements that exist in another form it then gets muddied saying this is it has magical healing properties it's part of the you can trace it back to the bible which is it's a fascinating story potentially uh, and there's some interesting links there but it's a bit unclear of where where science finishes and story begins is it not possible though that this sort of substance could be metaphysical in some way what do you mean by metaphysical? I don't know. <laughs> See, like... this is where you've got to be so cautious about this kind of stuff. Right. I think there's... <sighs> there's... <laughs> oh, the reason I'm huffing and puffing is because this does... It is a fascinating subject that does open up many discussion points. But you've got to be extremely careful in the language you use mm-hmm. to really... To, to not muddy the water about something. Now... I have my own sort of beliefs about how the universe and how existence is structured. Uh, And it sort of goes down into the realm of quantum physics and, you know, the the, the different states of reality that happen at those kind of places. Now, is it possible there's a substance that crosses those boundaries that we that that can exist in in solid form here yet has behavior that crosses out of the standard sort of Newtonian, let's say Newtonian physical science at a scale where quantum physics shouldn't be working yes i guess it is possible but this is so out of the realms of my ability to comment you know with any sense of authority that i'm very cautious now on the other hand when you link you know the stories that hudson tells about the the behavior of this substance what it does and there's some really i don't know if elegant is the right word there's some elegant links with some biblical stories that are really fascinating as well so you can drop into some there's some interesting paradigms and interesting links and does it drop into the metaphysical depending what you mean by that very potentially in so much as does it behave in a way that we don't expect normal materials to be, to behave in then very possibly well i think what i meant by that was if you're approaching it from a, a quantum level then the definition of metaphysical would be exactly as you described it it would be something that exists physically here but has a sort of you know, spiritual quality to it, some sort of otherworldly quality to it. You have to be careful with what what the basic premise of, a, of your statement there is. What does it mean to be spiritual? What does it mean to be otherworldly? Does that mean you believe in spirits? If it does, then you, you need to take your belief back and say, well, where do spirits live? Mm-hmm. What are they? What is the structure that creates them, gives them energy? Now, it's perfectly possible to create a scientific st- theory that postulates there's another energy level somewhere else or another form of of organization in which something as complicated as consciousness could live and that would be i guess what you're calling spirituality that there is a uh, a different layer of intelligence outside of what we consider sort of ordinary existence now that's not necessarily metaphysical that's not necessarily spiritual and I think these these big encompassing words that people use to sort of explain away or to f- try and find answers for their problems 
end up becoming catch-all phrases that really offer very little in terms of our understanding or our furtherment because they're a little bit muddy, they're a little bit loose, and you know, you, you, it becomes unclear what you're actually saying. Do I think, ultimately, though, that this stuff might be some kind of crossover element? I think there's a possibility there that it somehow sits in that slightly in-between space between this, the physical reality we see let's call it the extrusion from the other realm or something, and the sort of information that, or the the, the matter, the way matter comes from that. But that is such a a vague and such a personal sense of intuition of how to sort of sum something up that I, I would be very careful to use any of that kind of statement in a even, even approaching a a sort of a, a statement of belief so your your worldview then, as you touched on a few minutes ago, you look at it from a, a quantum standpoint then, right? What I look at what? I look at almost from a quantum, well, quantum no, standpoint no, just or my, the, my worldview. The composition of the universe. You mentioned how you look at it from a, a quantum mechanical standpoint. I look at my, my belief in the universe sort of comes from the idea that, all right, we have the Big Bang, but, the, but there's, there was rules – there are rules that guide mathematics. And now the reason why mathematics is so stunningly elegant is that the mathematics of the rules of mathematics somehow transcend into our existence. And they pre, you know, you you can pre from mathematics, you can say, here's, you can work out a theory that predicts something that's going to happen in the real world. So there's this extraordinary relationship between mathematics and the, the nature of reality. The question is, did the rules of mathematics predate the Big Bang or did the rules of mathematics and thus particle elemental and quantum physics come out of that? It's a very complex argument and ultimately it's kind of impossible to know. So you've got to kind of just take a stance at some point and go, hmm, I think it was one way or the other. And it's almost an aesthetic decision. You know, what do you, which one do you prefer the feel of? And I prefer the feeling of the idea that there was some kind of these these rules predated the Big Bang, which means something created those rules. So I'm kind of pinning my, my beliefs to the master a little bit, saying look, I do believe in some kind of, I hate using this word because it's been usurped by certain groups, but I believe in some kind of intelligent design. So once I've explained that, then it's complicated to talk about, at one level, the pure science of something, and on another level, how deep are you going into this sort of esoteric world, and where does understanding reality stop and your kind of gut feeling about something in terms of its, let's call it, God-related nature come in. Does that even get close to answering your question? Yeah, but it, it makes me wonder, though, if you believe in intelligent design... Uh, this, see, that's this... what I... I Go ahead. Let's, let's pull back. On, do I believe... What I'm, when I say I believe in intelligent design, what I'm saying is that I have a tendency to believe that I think the rules were probably there before the Big Bang. That doesn't mean I believe in a godhead that sits there making decisions and creating the world. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that I just have a sense that... Look at this. We we can go so far back with science. We can go to the Big Bang. From From the Big Bang hence forward, we have some pretty good understandings of how things came to be. Now, if we want to look at Ormus or this, whatever you want to call this substance, there are ways to examine this and look at it. And that's called applying the scientific principle, creating an experiment and getting rid of as many anomalies and trying to figure something out. Ultimately, anything you'll trace back to the Big Bang and what created those rules. So that's where you've got to start from. But that doesn't actually affect whether I believe in God or not, or some kind of higher creation or some kind of design or not, doesn't change how you would do the science on Ormus right now. Is it possible, though, that there are just things that exist in this reality, however you want to define it, that material science just can't observe or measure? Yes, that's what I think I'm saying. Ultimately, and ultimately, I'd say that the, the key question to that or the key answer to that is it's or, or an exa- a key example of that kind of question is like, you know, Again, the rules of mathematics. What created the laws of mathematics? It's, we, we can't really go to a point where we can answer that question. So that's why I mean you at some point you kind of got to, got to make an aesthetic, aesthetic decision about that. How does it feel in your worldview? So that doesn't mean that you can be any, you need to be any less 
vigorous in applying good scientific principles to the study of the things that are relevant and do sit in this physical plane. Because actually the kind of big questions we're talking about are so big that you can't study them anyway. Right. But it does open the door to, I guess it opens the door to imagination a little bit in terms of thinking of bigger picture solutions. Well, are you um, familiar with the term or the idea of quantum ether? Mm, I, can, I can imagine what it means, but I don't specifically know what that is, no. Okay, so basically ether from a, a scientific standpoint would be like a um, non-observable, to the physical senses, sort of consciousness that would be your intelligent creative force, I guess, that you can draw from it. So this is where you might be able to manipulate or harness this energy somehow, which is kind of crosses over into the realm that we're talking about. I say sure, that I mean, there's, there's all sorts of names. Go ahead. There's, there's all sorts of names for that idea that there's something in between the atoms. Yes. That, that, that there's, you know, there, there's many theories about the quantum foam or the, uh, the zero point or... Um, yeah, this is all the, the, the same the, 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 sort of idea. Yeah. Well, it's, the idea is that there's something there that, you know, empty space doesn't exist. Yeah, this is, and this I is think what Tesla was experimenting with. The, I don't know enough about him to... to and I don't, certainly don't, I, I, I wouldn't feel qualified to, to really talk about that. It's not an area I know about, particularly I have intuitions about that sort of thing. But I, don't, I kind of like the idea that there's something else there. Um, I mean, I, the, the theory that I've become the most attached to that made the most sense to me was the, the holographic universe theory. Mm-hmm. Have you ever heard of that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, for sure. So, you know, that, that this reality is an unfolding from another sort of data point. That this is just that there's another kind of uh, there's another plane that holds this information. This reality that we see is just the sort of an unfolding from that. That kind of makes sense to me. That sort of says it's it's a nice model for me to get my head around. But again, it's the danger is you spend so much time trying to crowbar your belief structures and the things that you see in reality to fit in with these basically pretty nebulous models theories that we have that you miss the point of doing the science in this side of the reality spectrum, which actually has, that actually can create useful answers. This doesn't change the fact, though, that you made a documentary about a substance that you could physically ingest. You actually used this white powder. You put this on your body, you put it in your body, and you had observable effects to your physiology, right? Right. So... If first-hand experience doesn't convince you that it's real or exists, what more do you Well, uh, need, look at it this way. If, if, if I ingested a small amount of rat poison, I would have had a physical, I would have had a, a physical reaction. I would have felt something. Right. So what we have in the film is an anecdote of me taking this stuff and feeling slightly squirrely. And it's like, okay, there's something there. Don't know what it is. The fact that there's something there, or the fact that I had a reaction, is it's interesting telly. And, you know, the scene is kind of weird when I have my little sort of weird out scene in the in the woods going, right, you know, I'm feeling a bit trippy. Yeah, it's pretty psychedelic. But it, it, yeah. it, it is, isn't it? And it was a kind of weird moment for me. And it, it helped me continue on the journey because it made me feel like there is something interesting here. But as a single anecdote, you've got to be so careful about attaching scientific relevance to something like that. Because look at it this way. At this point, I was on a journey. I'd made the decision to go out and, and shoot a film about this stuff. I'd invested a lot of my own money in it. So I'm personally very invested in the idea of the story. Now, you know what the idea of a, um, when you create a, a response in your body, which, is, which comes from your mind. What's the word for that? What you, psychosomat- psychosomatic okay, illnesses. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I can't, with all honesty, put my hand on my heart and say, I don't know that I didn't sort of force that reaction out of myself because I so wanted it to happen. Now, if you'd taken a group of people, given some a placebo, some of this stuff, didn't tell other people what it was, measured their reactions, you know, you can get a significant data point from that and actually find out, is there something going on there? So having a sense of story or anecdote to back up your science is, makes it much more entertaining, makes it interesting, but it isn't scientifically relevant, which is why, this is why throughout the film, I, you know, I start off on this sort of quite woolly adventure, interviewing people who, who are using and working with almost in, in various different forms, all of who've got fascinating stories, all of whom had 
or most of whom had kind of failed to really stand back and take a a pragmatic approach to what they were looking at and anchor it in something a little bit more than the amazing anecdotes that they've heard from themselves and for other people, which is why I went into and said, look, I need to get something solid here. Can I take some of this stuff and turn it into gold? That, that gives me an indication that there really is something here that is tangible and different. As it happens, I got an awful lot of stick from the Ormus community for doing that. People saying you focused on the wrong thing. This, the, the interesting thing about this is the, the spiritual, the life, the healing, the, the medicinal side of it. I'm sure that's potentially very true. I just think you, you've got to be very careful when you're making a claim about something that you don't turn a scientific claim into a story. And then what happens is people end up using that story ultimately to benefit themselves rather than really trying to find out what the truth is here. This is what I mean. This is why I'm so cagey about this is that I've just ultimately seen a lot of charlatanism around this subject. People taking a truth, a small truth, an anomalous behavior, a story of anonymous behavior, turning it into a half truth. And from that creating essentially a lie about the efficacy of something well, not, not, not even a lie, but a, a dubious claim, which ultimately is driven by, by the desire to, uh, to make money. Okay, so there are cases documented in the film of people claiming that, for example, using Ormus on their crops or their seeds helps them grow bigger and better and faster, that this stuff cured someone's cancer. How do you respond to those people now then? So the, the one about the crops is very interesting. That was Arthur Ziegler. Now, he, I think, was one of the most compelling guys that I actually filmed. I only had one day with him, unfortunately. He has done exactly what I said you should do. Is like He f- saw these claims. He was a mineral, mineral scientist, metallurgist. Made these, saw these claims, found that it was quite similar to something he was doing. Went out and put, put some experiments together that would give him results. He realized that if you want to get results... Stay away from humans. You can create tests with plants much quicker and animals much easier. He got some very, very compelling data um, that says there is something interesting going on here. Here's a substance that people are saying isn't anything different. There's nothing there. But if you put it into, let's say, the soil, or if you mix it in with animal food, the animals seem to have more resilience to, to infection and the plants grow better. So, yes, it does seem there's something really interesting going on there good science i don't know what it is it could just be that before we knew what vitamins were if you if you fed someone a lime when they had scurvy you got a cure it's not because limes cure scurvy it's because vitamin c scurvy is a vitamin c deficiency so it was understanding vitamins that made us recognize the importance of uh, you know that there are elements there that have certain functions so it could just be that these elements have a function in the metabolic pathway that we haven't recognized yet because we don't recognize the elements. That in itself is an absolutely fascinating and very, very valid thing to to pursue. But then be careful about mixing that with the esoteric. On the other hand, there are some interesting connections there with the esoteric, which, which are worth pursuing in themselves if you think in that realm as well. My point is here is that I'm not saying that this stuff doesn't exist. I'm not saying that there isn't a connection with something more interesting and deeper in terms of reality. I'm not saying that it doesn't turn into God. All these things are they're indicators that, you know, I, I saw and kind of witnessed. What I'm sort of saying is here is you've, people have to be much more precise with their language and much more precise with how they represent fact as opposed to anecdote. And just, just to, to pull that back into something that I've always felt slightly uncomfortable about this with is films are not a good place to make that definition. Films, by the very nature, are really consumed for entertainment most of the time. I know people say it's like, well, it's a documentary, you know, I'm, I'm trying to learn here. But most of the time, it's people sit and watch these films or films in general in downtime. And for a film to be successful, it has to have an element of ent- entertainment in it. The way I did that with my movie is, you know, what I did was I filmed the journey of myself. So it's someone on an adventure looking for a goal. There's always an element of that in a movie, which is presenting the facts in such a way that they are entertaining. So in that respect, you've got to be careful, no matter what film you're watching, you've got to be careful that there is an element of representation here that isn't necessarily just telling the facts as they are because if you're just telling facts as they are it's you know that's that's bar graphs and scientific data not very entertaining 
Well, yeah, I mean, you have to have a compelling story or else yeah. who the fuck's going to watch the movie? <laughs> exactly. If you're without a compelling story, it's, it's, it's not a movie. So within that, there's, there's always a little bit of, of work that you do when you're editing it or playing the right music cue or, you know, you follow someone on camera you, who's interesting or is going to make good telly but doesn't necessarily further the science. But, you know, again, it's not my job to, I'm a filmmaker, it's not my job to get to the absolute bottom of this. It's my job to, I guess I saw my job here is to open this story to a wider audience. Again, this comes back to my decision to sort of focus on the gold in the second half. Gold is something that people understand. It's, it's you know, if you haven't heard about Ormus, you've heard about gold. So you can, it's, it's a much easier way to pitch the story to an audience that haven't heard about it. Those within the community, and I got, as I said, I got a lot of stick about this for focusing on the gold because a, they're very secretive about it for some reason, and b, they see that as me just as what I was doing was simply trying to benefit and trying to make money out of something. And you know, I make a living in this industry. I had a lot of people telling me I should give this film away for free because the the knowledge is so important. But it's you know that, that that's such a an unrealistic view of how people spend their lives. I mean, you know, the, the truth is, I don't know many people who go into a restaurant and expect to be fed for free. So, right. That does bring up a good point, though. Talking about the film itself, there is essentially two separate goals to the film. And the first is just exploring this substance called Ormus and if it's real, if it's if it has the effects that people claim that it does, you know, on the human body or on plants or other life forms, I guess. But that second part, like you've been talking about, is more about alchemy. And if that's a real process that can be obtained from any substance, just any sort of base metal, right? I never heard the correlation between taking Ormus and turning it into gold before until I watched your film. So what was the ultimate goal here? Was it to explore Ormus or was it to, to just make gold out of it and see if, no, that's, if that's a very good question. Real? That's absolutely. I mean, I guess, how did I get into this? Uh, and why did I make the film is look, I was at the time I was writing a, a film script. And one of the things I needed to research was how is gold mined in the informal sector? You know, as in old-fashioned artisanal gold mining. That's when I stumbled across the um, the, the Hudson story. So the connection between, for, for me, the, the the connection, the route into Ormus came through the gold. So that was always something that I had in my mind. The connection between Ormus and alchemy is, it's a bit more tenuous. To call one the other is, it's not something that is very clear. So alchemy, the idea, the idea of alchemy is that. Uh, you can take an element, uh, sorry, an atomic element, let's say a, a, an atom of gold, knock out one neutron, three protons and a few electrons. And you're, I think if you've done that, then you've, you've actually made mercury, if I've got my numbers right. There's two elements, there's two sides to this almost story. One is saying that it is, let's take the gold example, it is gold in a slightly different form. So it's gold, it always has been gold, it's in a form that you don't recognise. You do something to it, it turns back into the recognisable form. There's another side of this, which is saying, actually, what if you, if you sort of follow quite closely at the end of the film, that the numbers change over time in terms of the, the results we get back from, from those tests, which says that there's some kind of radioactive energy that's in there that's making these changes happen. And it indicates that there could actually be changes happening at an atomic level from the gold particles to become other particles themselves. So the, the, what, I'm, what I'm trying to sort of differentiate here is alchemy specifically saying you can take a metal, you can do some stuff to it, and you can convert it into another metal. Now, a particle physicist, a particle physicist a nuclear physicist will tell you, yes, you can, but you need the Large Hadron Collider to do that, or you need uh, an atomic explosion, or you need the surface of a sun. You need those kind of energies to break down the bonds between the, the various structures of an atom. Almost starts bridging that gap, or the, the theories behind almost starts bridging that gap a little bit. That's not to say Ormus proves the alchemists were right. But what it might say is the original alchemists, they weren't changing silver into gold necessarily or, or lead into gold. What they had was uh, something like an Ormus substance that was conflating the story a little bit. I'm unclear on this. It would be fascinating. I mean, look, if this is the case, it, genuinely the, the most fascinating thing about the Ormus story would be that can you genuinely affect the bonds 
between the particles of an atom outside of a nuclear reaction. I mean, that could be the sort of information and theory that could really change the way we, we live. Well, so. you, you did attempt to make gold. You know, that's the big climax of the film here. And you just touched on the results that you got from that experiment. Could you maybe just summarize what you did and how you did it? Yes. So what, what it was, I, I, the second sort of half of the film is when I meet Don Nance, who's this, uh, who's a, a guy in the Ormus community, but he's a little bit res, re, removed from them at some level. It took me a long time for him to, to convince him, but eventually he said, right, I'll show you this method for what he calls knocking it back to metal. So I went and I stayed with him in florida for a few weeks and it's quite a slow process essentially starting with sea salt dried sea salt you reconstitute it as in you mix it with water so it becomes sea water and then drop sodium hydroxide i believe it was into that you get a precipitate out of that that precipitate that comes out that you dry out the white powder is what people say is high in almost minerals so if you send that off to a lab they say yes this is salt this is you know the usual stuff and i think magnesium calcinate or something like that. I can't remember what the other specific sort of white powdery stuff would be. The theory is that within that, it's high in these, because it comes from the sea, that this process also drops out, precipitates out almost um, minerals, i.e. the the gold, silver elements, essentially, that seem to come from the, the platinum group of metals in the periodic table, drops out into the powdery, into this powdery form as well. We then did a process on that, which includes a burn and a mix and, and doing various things with it that creates that, that supposedly knocks these these orbitally rearranged molecules back into the traditional metallic form so that when you send it off to the lab now you're seeing metallic elements and the results i had in in one of the samples uh or the, the sample actually that i sent off I, from what i could recall there was a two thousand fold increase in silver content and a 800-fold increase in gold content and copper. And again, it was the, the elements in the platinum group of metals that had this very strange and very large increase in quantity. So what that did was support the theory. I, did, I, I created one experiment where the theory that I'm told that there is gold here where we can't measure gold was supported. So for me, that was, that was the key. It's like, okay, I've actually got some evidence of my own that supports some of these stories. And that, for me, that was the, sort of the key point. It's like there is something potentially here. But again, you've got to be careful. It was just one not very well run experiment. It wasn't bad, but, you know, I did it without the help of a, a spectroscopic analysis. Because the thing about this science here is it's all about measuring incredibly carefully. You've got to measure exactly what goes in and exactly what goes out. And it's actually quite hard to do that properly. So what I did in a, a fairly entertaining way was come to a result that supports the theory. So you've had the personal experience of consuming Ormus. You've had the personal experience then of testing. Just to own... get it straight, I don't, I don't consume Ormus anymore. I did for a little bit. I just wanted to see what it would do. That's a good point. So you consumed Ormus for a little while, I'm assuming, during the filming, maybe after the filming. I have no idea how no, long. No, I was very – I didn't on the film. During the film, I was very careful not to because I wanted to be – I didn't want to have it in me in case someone offered it to me. So those times when you see on the film it being offered to me, they're genuinely the first times. Or there's, there's one first time when I do it by myself and there's another time when someone else gives it to me. I think – I can't, can't remember now. So it was for me, it was like this is when I'm trying it out for the first time. I wanted that to be on camera. And then I, I, I didn't, I don't think I carried on until I finished filming, I'm not sure. So once I finished filming, although this, it was over a period of sort of two years almost, various people offered me some and I kind of had different ones, different strength ones, tried them out. Long term, I didn't, I mean, even when I was doing them, I didn't really notice any kind of, any changes of, of any sort, really. Not in terms of energy or clarity or anything like that. What about the experiment you filmed where you were hooked up and the guy was measuring your alpha brain waves? Yeah, I mean, that was interesting. Absolutely. I'm, I'm not saying that there's not something that... I'm, look, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that there isn't a, metabolical, a metabolic reaction to this kind of stuff. That's not what I'm saying. I'm, it's almost as if I'm trying to tell you that almost doesn't exist. That's not the case. I spent, you know, four years of my life on this story, and I think there's something really fascinating here. All I'm saying is... Be careful in the language you use and be careful of the assertions you make 
they become anecdotes very quickly. So when that guy hooked me up to the EEG machine, you know, I took some Ormus and we measured the results and there were some changes there. Now the changes in alpha brain activity versus before or after. Again, it's one experiment of a single person who's emotionally attached to the outcome. Yes, it gives a positive result. And it's an interesting way of demonstrating there's something going on. And it's possible that we sort of touched on something actually quite fascinating there. So it did seem to have effects at me, on, effects on me at some level. But there's yet to be any properly conducted, as far as I know, any properly conducted group tests that back that claim up until, until you have something conducted as a, you know, that, that, that gives statistics, scientifically relevant statistical analysis. Really, all you have is anecdotes. So you just have to be very careful about how you present those. That's all I'm saying. Yes, some really interesting stuff happened. And I do think that there's a substance here that warrants way more research. And I've had, you know, since the film's been out, I've had some very interesting people contact me, you know, people who are embedded properly in the scientific community, uh, as well as the people who Hudson worked with on the original sort of story in the 1980s. I've had them contact me and say, look, Hudson might have been a weird fish, but w there is something interesting in this story as well and uh, sort of pointed me in different directions and so yes i i guess what i'm saying is i fully expect this to come out as a sort of more mainstream scientific discovery it will be called something else i'm sure you know if it's so whoever discovers it in their lab in whatever university will almost certainly shy away from calling it almost and certainly shy away from being associated with, with the kind of language that's put around this in the almost community the spiritual the spiritual stuff the, the associations the idea that if you take this as hudson said you will like quote you know from him you will be able to talk to angels and you will come out of your body and you will ascend into some kind of other spirituality you can't talk like that if you want to be taken seriously within the scientific community so well yeah that's a given because you won't get funding to do any research in any university lab for that but exactly you know yeah. you mentioned though that you had an emotional attachment to the outcome of these experiments and and obviously of your film in general but that i think opens up another avenue of this sort of esoteric conversation with with maybe like magical intention or i mentioned manifestation earlier you know just like using thought to produce a certain outcome is that maybe what we're talking about here in terms of yeah it could well be but what so, so check your language when you say magical what does magical mean to you as i'm just going to rephrase that in a way so you know what i'm trying to get from you you know arthur c Clarke said any technology that's sufficiently advanced presented to a culture will be called magic mm -hmm. but to you when you use the word magic what what do you what do you actually um thinking about Let, let's let's unpick this i don't want to put you in a in position because it's something i've thought about i don't want to put you in an awkward position but let's unpick it if you're saying there's an effect let's say you're you you have the the ability to manifest thoughts maybe that's true maybe it isn't and you're calling that i can magically man manifest thoughts now magic presupposes there's a, a power there that is well that's the question what is that power if you can do it there's got to be some mechanism to do it if there's a mechanism to do it it has to uh, exist within the world, within the realms of reality, reality being whatever, how big reality is, but it just assumes there is a mechanism. If you can do it, there's a mechanism to do it. It's just that we don't really at the present see that mechanism or how it can possibly work. So I, I used to, when I, when I lived in South Africa, when I lived in Los Angeles, I did a lot of work with horses and I recognized then that there's communication between organisms that is not visual. It's not verbal. It's something else. And I am personally, because I've seen it enough times, in, in no doubt that there are other forms of communication that that reside kind of fairly firmly in the world of what people would call ESP. I don't know how they work. I don't know how to really use them particularly successfully all the time, but there's something going on there. So outside of a scientific paradigm for that, it is, it's based in my experience. It's purely anecdotal, although there's, funnily enough, I think the, the, the field of Parapsychology. The field of parapsychology is one of the most regulated sciences that there is. You know, the results fairly regularly come out with with actually very good statistically relevant data. So the field of parapsychology sort of says that there's something going on there. The mechanisms that are behind that, knowing that mechanism is something else. Now, this is what we might call magic because we don't know what it is. But saying someone is using magic is saying they know 
how to manipulate it, how to use it. It's just, again, it's one of these catch-all words that I think when you start being precise with your language, you start being precise, you start being a bit more precise with the way you think. And ultimately, this is what philosophy is. I think one of the sort of basic tenets of philosophy, or, you know, good philosophical thinking, is you clarify beforehand exactly what it is that your your questions are and, and what your the words are that you're using. And if something's a bit woolly, then you take some time out and go, well, what do I actually mean by this? Okay, that's interesting. You get into a better place. You can have a more you can have a more condensed and productive conversation because you're you're all using words that have mechanisms and ideas to attach behind them. And then you're clearer about what it is that you're trying to find out, where the holes are. So I was thinking about what I would call magic or how I would define it as you were talking. And What, you mean you weren't listening to me? No, no, not at all. <laughs> not at all. <laughs> but I think that if I had to be as precise as I could be, because like you said, it's not something that's easily defined and I just really have no idea what it is. It's kind of an abstract concept. I would say it's probably the use of... I don't know what it would be then. The use of thought or action or maybe even you could go into like symbols, you know, if you look at things like sigils and things like that. The use of of these sorts of things to manipulate whatever sort of supernatural force may exist that we just can't see or measure scientifically. Yeah, it's just because we you don't know how it's working. You're doing something that you don't know how you do it. And you're giving it the catch-all name of magic. Yeah. Now, magic with that comes all sorts of associated. Let's use the word energy. It's not quite the right word, but um. So you know, you you can you could you could talk about let's say the relevance of numerology, uh, and using you know using the right numbers in your in your phone. Or if you can unpick and come to a, a, a sort of you can associate that with let's say the the, the laws of mathematics and find a way in that the, the two sort of actually approximate each other and there is a confluence between the two you're you're pulling away from mathematics and getting closer to an idea of the laws behind the energy that you're using so again it's just don't call it magic be a bit more considered in in what you're thinking about and you can begin to start thinking well how does this actually work and i guess that's the thing is i think there's a there's an awful lot of energies and inf- and, and and structures and systems that we haven't even begun to imagine how they work to us now on this planet to a lot of people who think that we are close to, you know, getting to a full understanding of how the universe works, talking about things like that, they'll say, oh, that's ridiculous. You're just inferring magic. But, you know, that's what scientists who are attached to their particular domain of science have been saying for years. So I think it was a word that works on both sides of the boundary to avoid really making us think carefully about what it is we're trying to say. I would agree with that 100%. So it seems that you were skeptical of your own findings then now as you look back on your film in hindsight. So No, see, I think, I, I know what you're saying, skeptical. It sounds, I have a skeptical tone of voice. It's not that I'm skeptical in so much as, I, it's not that I don't believe what I did. What I am is I am, I try to be as honest as I can be about, number one, how these results were framed in so much as they were, they were in a documentary which has, a relatively entertaining narrative to it so that's the one side that it's like that they're framed in such a way that obviously to make the film more interesting i pick and choose the sort of most interesting moments and present them in a way that feels very compelling that's what people do with films second of all i've seen so much woolly use of language and presentation of facts since i made this film especially around this subject that i've been i've become very wary of being unclear so i do i i, I can nail my beliefs to the the mast here it's like the journey I went on, the film is entertaining. I met some interesting people. I gave them lip service. I listened to them. I give some of them a slightly harder time. I produced a sort of basic experiment of my own that I filmed, the results of which I stand by. I think there is something going on with this field that has been called Ormus. I think it's going to come out at some stage, possibly in the not too distant future. It will probably come out in a different form, in a scientific journal as a matter discovery or maybe something like that. And I don't know if it's going to be associated with Ormus because the people in the Ormus world are not doing, as far as I can tell, they're not doing any science. So I think this film is a great way in, in an entertaining form, to, to, to have your eyes open to something that's potentially going to be a really big story. But as, a, as the scientist in me, when I have these conversations, I've, I'm always extra careful about how I, 
how I present that presentation that I made. Well, that's fair then. So if I said, Joe, right now I'm going to go online, I'm going to buy Ormus from some weird looking website, what am I going to get? <laughs> it's a good question. You know what? I get a lot of emails from that about that. People saying, seen your film, where do I buy Ormus? There's two places I send people to. One is Don Nance. He's the guy at the end that showed me how to, um, how to make the gold. I like the guy. I trust him. I just intuitively, you know, I saw how he makes his Ormus uh, or how, you know, what he does. I don't know what effects it will have on you. I have no idea really if it's, if it's just the equivalent of kind of a vitamin supplement for a diet that's been devoid of these things or if genuinely there is some kind of overarching medicinal healing quality to these things. I don't know. But if already you want to try something out, I'd say go to Don Nance. His, you can get his stuff on oceanalchemy.com. If you just Google that, I'm sure you'll find him. Also, there is another company who this is – Arthur, Arthur Ziegler, who was the, the mineralogist who helped set up those experiments with plants and animals, he was associated with a company called Liquid Chi. I would trust him. Beyond that, you know, there's lots of places you could sort of uh, sort of dabble. I don't know what you're going to get from it. Truth is, I think if you want to experiment with this stuff, try it out. Get some almost online, feed it to your animals, your plants rather, and eat the plants. If you really want to experiment, set up some tomatoes that you grow with almost, some that you don't with almost. See if there's a difference. It seems like if we don't know what it is, I'd be very, I, I'm quite wary about putting it in my system. Isolating something and then chowing a whole bunch of that and putting it in my system. I just think we don't know enough about it. So I'm wary of doing that. But if you put it into a plant and then eat the plant, I think, you know, you, you might get tasty vegetables. I don't really know. It seems to be the case, though. Sure, it, it doesn't seem to have killed anybody yet. Go and experiment with it. Go and buy some. Give it a go. But just so you know that I, I don't neck the stuff. I don't have a little bottle of it in my fridge that uh, I take with my morning coffee. <laughs> I've never used it personally. I can't speak to it. I only know what I know about it, which is what I've read online and, and seen in your film. So no firsthand experience to report. But I am pretty fucking curious about it. Hey, well, we should be curious about everything, shouldn't right. we? Yeah, absolutely. Good, curious mind. Uh, be, be open. And I think this this again goes to the sort of nature of anecdote. It's like we're curious. We're, we're always looking for stories that support our theories. If you never present facts to yourself in such a way that you can be convinced that actually you are wrong, you're you're going to end up always just you know on one side of the fence. Do you know what I mean? It's this sure. sort of echo chamber effect. Yeah. Well, there, Be careful there, about this... surrounding yourself with just people who think like you. Right. I do think there's something to the idea that if I buy Ormus and I think it's going to have a positive effect on my health, and then you know, three months after taking it, I feel healthier, I just automatically attribute that to taking Ormus. I sort of manifested that outcome in my mind, and now I've connected that outcome to what I thought was going to happen anyways. There you go. I mean, the whole placebo effect is a fascinating sure. question anyway. Yeah. It's like scientists will tell you, oh, that's just a placebo effect. But then, you know, if you ask, well, what is the placebo effect? That in itself is a very potent effect that says we are capable of healing ourselves if we convince ourselves that we can be healed. So within that catch-it-all term that science uses it to say this substance isn't effective, there sweeping under the carpet a very very interesting question that says well how come some people can heal themselves from quite profound illnesses and create metabolic changes in their body without any bioactive ingredients so this comes back to the sort of very original question you asked is like you know are there is there a, a, another level of activity in which we can all exist and affect ourselves outside of what we know already. And I think, of course, there is. Of course, there's more inter more interesting stuff to be discovered in this universe. Well, is alchemy in its esoteric form, is that real and plausible then? When you say it's esoteric form, you mean the sort of, again, that, that word, that, that, that spiritual, that word I don't like, the spiritual realm of yeah. sort of religious practice around it. Yes, yes. Uh, I've personally, I've never, I've never found that intriguing. But then I don't find the dogma around religion very intriguing. I think most religions have at their heart the sort of that, the, the proto morality that human beings seem to attach to, and they're codified in various ways, but all ultimately point to the same kind of belief structures, just using different symbols, sigils, or 
characters to, to describe that. I don't think there's anything particularly more interesting in the way those who study or follow alchemy have in this, this, you know, defining that then, let's say, a Buddhist or uh, I was going to say a Christian, but I mean, ultimately, the yeah, or a Christian, you know, it's or uh, whoever. So I'm not drawn to alchemy as a codified set of practices in itself. I think you can, I think we can perfectly well have a, uh, we can have morality as a science. There's no reason why morality has to be in the realm of the esoteric and religious thinkers that sort of split we have in society i think is uh, extremely unhealthy so yes no i don't particularly i'm not particularly drawn to alchemy as some kind of spiritual structure okay so knowing what you know now would you have made this film again huh um look i spent and lost a lot of money on it you know it cost me uh, tens of thousands i mean a lot of money to make the film I actually lost my house in the process, not just because of that, but because of some other films I invested in. So it's tricky to unpick where I was then to who I am now. It was an extraordinary journey. You know, it's the kind of adventure that, no, I would, I would, I would make it again, I think, but just in a different way now. But it's impossible to say I am now who I am because I made that film. Definitely. I learned yeah. so much about the world. I learned so much about people and business, about, you know, just going in head first and, and and having a crack at it myself. So I've had an extraordinary adventure from that. I I have no regrets. Put it this way: I have no regrets making that film. I'll never get the money back on it. But um, I think now, if I was going to make a film, I would make it very differently. In so much as what I find interesting about documentary now, it's not so much the presentation of fact. It's the the idea that when you get a film going, you create a momentum behind a project. So if you set a goal of which you're going to make a film about, the, the, the mere act of making a film creates a bigger likelihood that that goal is going to be achieved. So it's a very good way of gathering energy and people and resources around a project. And at the same time, if you make a film that way, you open up the likelihood to creating a more interesting narrative. But you have to be quite honest about your filmmaking that that's what you're doing. So the idea that you're presenting scientific facts in a film, I think, is is always a little bit. Certainly, new scientific discoveries is a little bit suspect because you will. If look at it another way, the, the point of my film was to learn how to make gold. Imagine if I hadn't got those results that I had at the end, I would probably keep doing things to try and find something that would either get me that result or I'm emotionally and financially wedded to getting the result that I needed which makes for a bad science project. So I think it's, it's how you frame the project is, is very important. That's not to say you can't make films about things like this, but I think let's say the other, the other way to make the film would be, I want to see if it's possible to get 10 real scientists into a room to actually conduct an experiment on this and see how they get on together, regardless of what the experimental results are. Well, that's a great note to wrap up on, man. I, I appreciate the time and the conversation because it's you know, very thought-provoking. I've had an interest in this stuff for a few years, but I've never got to that point where just talking about Ormus that I've wanted to try it. I've not really been convinced that it's real, that it's tangible, that it will have the effects on me that people claim that it does. I'm still open to it because I'm sort of like a biohacker of sorts. If you've heard that term, yeah, I've, I've heard the term. It's, it's yeah, people are people who are way braver than I am. Right. Yeah, I just <laughs> want to. I don't mind experimenting with my own biology. I, that's a fairly new thing that I've taken up. So I'm open to ingesting something, but I'm just cautious because of that sort of mental manifestation. You know, is my thought that this is going to cure me or heal me in some way going to produce that result and is that really measurable or is it just my own belief in it that makes it real so yeah yeah i think i think the interesting side to this is the science behind it i would be reticent to go munching on this stuff because we don't know what it does we don't know how it works we don't know what it is we can't measure it how can we possibly know what it's doing for us so why are you taking it because you've got a headache or because you're lonely or because you've got cancer or whatever? It's We don't know. For some people, you know, if it's a last resort, then I can understand that. And there's sort of a number of, you know, there's cancer cure stories out there. Cancer gets cured in, in numbers of different ways. This could be one of them. It might not be. I don't know. 
Right. Experiment. I think, you know, if, if you're a biohacker, you know, I presume you've done psychotropics and all sorts of things. It's a lot less interesting than ayahuasca, I would say, as, as, a, as something to ingest. I've never done um, ayahuasca, so I can't the, even talk about that. Listen, mate, if you're going to take a, if you're going to take a, if you're going to try something that is going to have profound effects on your perception of reality, uh, I would go down a route like that. I think you'll be mildly disappointed with Ormus, but give it a go. You, you never know. Get you know, get in touch with Don Nance and see if uh, what he recommends. I like the guy. It's okay. uh, don't expect too much from it. All right, man. Uh, well, hey, like I said, appreciate the time. Appreciate you revisiting something that I apparently dug out of the internet ether. So <laughs> there you go. Yeah, exactly. Oh, it's good to it's good to chat about this again. I do enjoy. It. It's, a, it's a good subject. We have a good yarn. I think we've had a, a jolly nice conversation. It's Absolutely, been interesting man. chatting to you. Well, thank you very much. All right, Chief. I appreciate that, and, and good work on putting these uh, these shows together. I think it's uh, this that's the right way to be using the internet. You're doing a good job there. Oh, well, thank you very much, dude. I I don't do this for money or fame or anything like that. I, I just do it to have interesting conversations with interesting people. There you go. Yeah. Exactly. That's, so that's why I continue to make films. Well, look, I appreciate you reaching out and having a chat, and I've had fun today. Same here, man. I'll be in touch with you soon, all right? All right, boss. You have a good one. Take you care, too. mate. All right, there you have it. My thanks again to Joe DeCat. You can watch his documentary at allthegoldyoucaneat.com. That's linked in the show notes. I believe it costs around $7 for the hour documentary, but you also get about three hours of bonus content as well. Well worth the cash if you can spare it and have an interest in the subject. Jury is still out for me on Ormus personally. I haven't tried it yet. Not sure if I will, but I do think Joe's recommendation to grow some vegetables with it is worthwhile for anyone who may be interested in the substance. I don't have anything further to add here. I tried to get this episode out a few days ago, but I had some technical issues with some other recent episodes I recorded that held me up. I still haven't been able to solve those issues, by the way. No excuses, though. My apologies. Either way, I hope you enjoyed the chat. If you did, please leave the show a good rating on iTunes or hit that subscribe button on whatever channel you found us on. And until next time, this is O'Culture. I am Ryan Peverly reminding you to love yourself, think for yourself, and question authority.